Now open your question paper and look at part one. You will hear three different extracts. For questions one to six, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract one. The latest wave of worry started in the 1960s, and there's been a proliferation of societies for the preservation of pure English ever since. And you know, when all else fails, when they've got nowhere with teachers and public figures and so on, these people would write to us. And I drew the short straw of having to deal with all those letters complaining about the language. These range from those drawing our attention to our own piddling misprints, to those vilifying the general use of vogue words such as ongoing or scenario or whatever in the media, and those cataloguing the alleged mispronunciation of newsreaders. This latter being a real obsession with some of the most persistent correspondents. The latest wave of worry started in the 1960s, and there's been a proliferation of societies for the preservation of pure English ever since. And you know, when all else fails, when they've got nowhere with teachers and public figures and so on, these people would write to us. And I drew the short straw of having to deal with all those letters complaining about the language. These range from those drawing our attention to our own piddling misprints, to those vilifying the general use of vogue words such as ongoing or scenario or whatever in the media, and those cataloguing the alleged mispronunciation of newsreaders, this latter being a real obsession with some of the most persistent correspondents. Extract 2 So, you're finished with competitive skating, and you're going to carry on choreographing ice shows. What else? Well, I'm only 42, full of energy. And I hear you've taken to the boards. <laughs> I love the stage. There's something about the immediacy of being on stage with an audience that's 10 metres away from you, as opposed to the distance in an ice arena. And I've been fortunate enough not only to have skated on a theatrical stage and have the audience there, but also to have danced in some of the great shows, Cats, uh, Rocky Horror. But when you dance, don't you miss the skates terribly? I don't miss the skates, but in rehearsals it did take some getting used to. In ice skating you take a few steps and you've travelled 20 metres at high speed. I was ten pin bowling with the rest of the cast. I was making my steps and banging into other people. Then I realised you can do all this great choreography and move nowhere. So, you're finished with competitive skating, and you're going to carry on choreographing ice shows. What else? Well, I'm only 42, full of energy. And I hear you've taken to the boards. <laughs> I love the stage. There's something about the immediacy of being on stage with an audience that's 10 metres away from you, as opposed to the distance in an ice arena. And I've been fortunate enough not only to have skated on a theatrical stage and have the audience there, but also to have danced in some of the great shows, Cats, uh, Rocky Horror. But when you dance, don't you miss the skates terribly? I don't miss the skates, but in rehearsals it did take some getting used to. In ice skating you take a few steps and you've travelled 20 metres at high speed. I was 10 pin bowling with the rest of the cast. I was making my steps and banging into other people. Then I realised you can do all this great choreography and move nowhere. Extract 3 I thought the film was rather limp and morose, a rather low-powered film, and unfortunately not a very good adaptation of the novel. 
I think part of the problem is that this particular novelist is not a very filmic writer on many occasions. Most of the pleasures one gets from reading him are pleasures of language. He's, he's very playful. He's very witty with language. But the message goes straight from the eye to the brain. You don't need pretty pictures to intervene. So wisely, on the one hand, the filmmakers have skipped a lot of the verbal playfulness, but what they're left with is a rather pedestrian story, firmly set in the 70s, examining the issue of conformity, and it all seems to have lost its relevance. The other thing which is lost in the translation is that the heroes, Chris and Tony, are very clever boys. They're very bright and witty. But in the film, Chris is a rather pedestrian character. Tony, who in the book is a rather exotic character, whose sense of otherness Chris wants to emulate, just comes across as a bit of a thug and oh, totally unappealing. I thought the film was rather limp and morose, a rather low-powered film, and unfortunately not a very good adaptation of the novel. I think part of the problem is that this particular novelist is not a very filmic writer on many occasions. Most of the pleasures one gets from reading him are pleasures of language. He's, he's very playful, he's very witty with language, but the message goes straight from the eye to the brain. You don't need pretty pictures to intervene. So wisely, on the one hand, the filmmakers have skipped a lot of the verbal playfulness, but what they're left with is a rather pedestrian story, firmly set in the 70s, examining the issue of conformity, and it all seems to have lost its relevance. The other thing which is lost in the translation is that the heroes, Chris and Tony, are very clever boys. They're very bright and witty. But in the film, Chris is a rather pedestrian character. Tony, who in the book is a rather exotic character, whose sense of otherness Chris wants to emulate, just comes across as a bit of a thug and oh, totally unappealing. That is the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You'll hear a talk given by a naturalist who's interested in a type of insect called the damselfly. For questions 7 to 15, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds in which to look at part 2. Good evening. Now, you may think that looking into the murky depths of a muddy pond doesn't sound much like fun. But I have many happy childhood memories of doing just that as I went hunting for the insects that have always fascinated me. For it is in surroundings like these that you can find one of the fastest and oldest species of insect in the world, the dragonfly, and its elusive but beautiful smaller cousin, the damselfly. The speed of these insects is estimated to vary from 35 to 60 miles per hour, and fossilised remains show them to have been in existence 300 million years ago. But apart from that, relatively little is known about these creatures, particularly the damselfly, the abundance and distribution of which in Britain can only be guessed at. What is known is that changes to the rural landscape have been affecting the population of these charming creatures over recent decades. Developments such as land drainage and the filling in of ponds have certainly taken their toll, but exactly how much is difficult to assess. And this is where you come in, because conservation organisations desperately need your help in locating the remaining damselfly habitats. So... How do you go about this? Well, first of all, when you make what you think is a sighting of a damselfly, it is necessary to make a positive identification. The insect is similar to its close relation, the dragonfly, but differs in several respects. Firstly, the dragonfly has a rapid, strong flight, 
while its damsel cousin is delicate with frail wings and is therefore relatively weak in flight. Secondly, you should try to observe the insect when it is at rest. When the dragonfly is not flying, its wings are held out at right angles to its body. This is in direct contrast to the damselfly, which holds its wings over its body, so that they are touching each other rather like a butterfly. I would like to emphasize that this is a stronger distinguishing feature than, say, the eyes or body. As regards coloring, damselflies can be blue, red, or green, but these are not ordinary colors. There's nothing muted about them. They're vivid, and they sparkle in the sunlight like jewels as the insects dart about from place to place. And some of them have names that reflect this: the emerald damselfly and the azure damselfly, both of which may be spotted locally. It is, however, the more prosaically named blue-tailed damselfly that is actually the most frequently sighted in the region. Whilst others you might see include the common blue damselfly, which is not as common as its name suggests, and the large red damselfly, which is thought almost to have died out locally. And so, if you should get a sighting of that one, we'd certainly be interested in hearing about it. Now, where and when to look for them? Well, not surprisingly, the summer months are best, from May onwards, but not much after August. It is a relatively short season, and you need to be looking in areas where there is water. Although you may find them in gardens, especially near slow-moving streams, damselflies really thrive in the vegetation that's found in and around still water. It's here that they find the smaller flying insects, which are their prey. And it's also here that they lay their eggs below the surface of the water. In terms of the best time of day, avoid the afternoon and evenings because these insects are definitely early risers. The ideal time to catch up with them is soon after dawn. And so, please, if you see damselflies and if you find them as captivating as I do, then please don't just walk away and forget them. The Conservation Trust is keen to produce a survey of the remaining sites that provide a habitat, and so put pressure on the authorities to preserve them for future generations. So do let them know what you see, and where you see it. Now you'll hear part two again. Good evening. Now you may think that looking into the murky depths of a muddy pond doesn't sound much like fun, but I have many happy childhood memories of doing just that as I went hunting for the insects that have always fascinated me. For it is in surroundings like these that you can find one of the fastest and oldest species of insect in the world, the dragonfly, and its elusive but beautiful smaller cousin, the damselfly. The speed of these insects is estimated to vary from 35 to 60 miles per hour, and fossilized remains show them to have been in existence 300 million years ago. But apart from that, relatively little is known about these creatures, particularly the damselfly, the abundance and distribution of which in Britain can only be guessed at. What is known is that changes to the rural landscape have been affecting the population of these charming creatures over recent decades. Developments such as land drainage and the filling in of ponds have certainly taken their toll, but exactly how much is difficult to assess. And this is where you come in, because conservation organisations desperately need your help in locating the remaining damselfly habitats. So. How do you go about this? Well, first of all, when you make what you think is a sighting of a damselfly, it is necessary to make a positive identification. The insect is similar to its close relation, the dragonfly, but differs in several respects. Firstly, the dragonfly has a rapid, strong flight, while its damsel cousin is delicate with frail wings and is therefore relatively weak in flight. Secondly, you should try to observe the insect when it is at rest. When the dragonfly is not flying, its wings are held out at right angles to its body. This is in direct contrast to the damselfly, which holds its wings over its body, so that they are touching each other rather like a butterfly. 
I would like to emphasize that this is a stronger distinguishing feature than, say, the eyes or body. As regards coloring, damselflies can be blue, red, or green, but these are not ordinary colors. There's nothing muted about them. They're vivid, and they sparkle in the sunlight like jewels as the insects dart about from place to place. And some of them have names that reflect this: the emerald damselfly and the azure damselfly, both of which may be spotted locally. It is, however, the more prosaically named blue-tailed damselfly that is actually the most frequently sighted in the region. Whilst others you might see include the common blue damselfly, which is not as common as its name suggests, and the large red damselfly, which is thought almost to have died out locally. And so, if you should get a sighting of that one, we'd certainly be interested in hearing about it. Now, where and when to look for them? Well, not surprisingly, the summer months are best, from May onwards, but not much after August. It is a relatively short season, and you need to be looking in areas where there is water. Although you may find them in gardens, especially near slow-moving streams, damselflies really thrive in the vegetation that's found in and around still water. It's here that they find the smaller flying insects, which are their prey. And it's also here that they lay their eggs below the surface of the water. In terms of the best time of day, avoid the afternoon and evenings because these insects are definitely early risers. The ideal time to catch up with them is soon after dawn. And so, please, if you see damselflies and if you find them as captivating as I do, then please don't just walk away and forget them. The Conservation Trust is keen to produce a survey of the remaining sites that provide a habitat, and so put pressure on the authorities to preserve them for future generations. So do let them know what you see, and where you see it. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You'll hear a radio interview with the artist Madeline No. For questions sixteen to twenty, choose the answer A, B, C, or D, which fits best according to what you hear. You now have one minute in which to look at part three. Her paintings reflect the peaceful nature of country life: a vase of pansies or roses, a few buttercups or some bluebells. A new book, *The Art of Madeline Knowles*, has been published this week to coincide with her 75th birthday, and she currently has exhibitions in London and Cardiff. Madeline, why do you usually paint very peaceful subjects rather than the harsher realities of life? Well, I think the thing about plants actually is that they're quite wonderful. They're absolutely adapted to survival, and I, I think that what we see as grace and beauty is actually strength. When I'm painting flowers, I'm looking for their inner strength and wanting to show it. It isn't for me done in order to be peaceful. It's done in order to discover that something inside which keeps them going. But is art then just to please the eye and calm the nerves? Because well, that's how we respond to it, isn't it? I think mankind has always needed art for magic, for celebration, for embellishment, and artists, meanwhile, have been trying to produce some sort of sense out of this funny old world in which we exist. And I think artists today, well, we're still trying to find that order and show it to people when we paint. So you don't approve of what's called the modern movement? 
I think my kind of painting is part of the modern movement, but it's a description that gets overused and often in a misleading fashion. For example, those artists at the so-called cutting edge are only one very small part of it, which gets a lot of attention in the media and elsewhere. <laughs> Now you began as a designer of textiles rather than a painter. Why did you change? Was it very important to you to paint? <laughs> well, I jumped into it really. I hadn't sought the change at all. I was teaching drawing at the time as well as doing my own design work, and I was suddenly asked for some reason, staff shortages or something, to、uh, to do the painting classes with the students as well. So it made me shift. I had to get a box of paints and go out and paint myself in order to feel prepared. And of course, I found it such a—I don't know—almost sort of a, an enormous relief that I haven't looked back since. <laughs> yeah, well, and these days you teach just the one rather famous person, I believe. What was it in your work that appealed particularly to Andy Benson, the rock star? Well, I think he saw a little painting of mine in an exhibition. It, it had a.、Um, A pathway running up to a village, I think, but it was the image that caught his attention. Because when I got to his house, I was early, and so I was waiting in the sitting room for a quarter of an hour or so. And I looked out of the window and saw that he was outside creating a path with stones. And it struck me that it must have been that image which had appealed to him. I understand that on seeing my picture, he'd said, "Oh, I'd like my garden painted like that." <laughs> and initially, that's what you were invited to do, of course. <laughs> that's right. But then later he did ask me for advice about his own paintings, which you gave. Oh yes, we had to go through them because he was working for an exhibition the following year. And your advice was? Oh, it was the usual art school advice about big shapes and little shapes. Quite a formal discussion. It wasn't about how he felt about the landscapes that he was doing. That's for him. I treat him just like an art school student, really. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Madeline Knowles, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. Now you'll hear part three again. Her paintings reflect the peaceful nature of country life: a vase of pansies or roses, a few buttercups or some bluebells. A new book, *The Art of Madeline Knowles*, has been published this week to coincide with her seventy-fifth birthday, and she currently has exhibitions in London and Cardiff. Madeline, why do you usually paint very peaceful subjects rather than the harsher realities of life? Well, I think the thing about plants actually is that they're quite wonderful. They're absolutely adapted to survival, and I, I think that what we see as grace and beauty is actually strength. When I'm painting flowers, I'm looking for their inner strength and wanting to show it. It isn't for me done in order to be peaceful. It's done in order to discover that something inside which keeps them going. But is art then just to please the eye and calm the nerves? Because well, that's how we respond to it, isn't it? I think mankind has always needed art for magic, for celebration, for embellishment, and. Artists, meanwhile, have been trying to produce some sort of sense out of this funny old world in which we exist, and I think artists today, well, we're still trying to find that order and show it to people when we paint. So you don't approve of what's called the modern movement? I think my kind of painting is part of the modern movement, but it's a description that gets overused and often in a misleading fashion. For example, those artists at the so-called cutting edge. Are only one very small part of it, which gets a lot of attention in the media and elsewhere. <laughs> Now you began as a designer of textiles rather than a painter. Why did you change? Was it very important to you to paint? <laughs> well, I jumped into it really. I hadn't sought the change at all. I was teaching drawing at the time as well as doing my own design work, and I was suddenly asked for some reason, staff shortages or something, to、uh, to do the painting classes with the students as well. So it made me shift. I had to get a box of paints and go out and paint myself in order to feel prepared. And of course, I found it such a, well, I don't know, almost sort of a, an enormous relief that I haven't looked back since. <laughs> yeah, well, and these days you teach just the one rather famous person, I believe. What was it in your work that appealed particularly to Andy Benson, the rock star? Well, I think he saw a little painting of mine in an exhibition. It, it had a.、Um, A pathway running up to a village, I think, but 
It was the image that caught his attention, because when I got to his house, I was early, and so I was waiting in the sitting room for a quarter of an hour or so, and I looked out of the window and saw that he was outside creating a path with stones, and it struck me that it must have been that image which had appealed to him. I understand that on seeing my picture he'd said, Oh, I'd like my garden painted like that. <laughs> and initially that's what you were invited to do, of course. <laughs> that's right. But then later he did ask me for advice about his own paintings. Which you gave? Oh, yes. We had to go through them because he was working for an exhibition the following year. Yeah, and your advice was? Oh, it was the usual art school advice about big shapes and little shapes. Quite a formal discussion. It wasn't about how he felt about the landscapes that he was doing. That's for him. I treat him just like an art school student, really. <laughs> <laughs> now, Madeline Knowles, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. That's the end of part three.